Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the side event to have a conversation in further depth about uh, Mercury and uh, human rights. I want to start by thanking the Geneva Environment Network, as well as uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for their support in putting this uh, side event together. And I am really pleased to have the opportunity to introduce to you the various panelists that will be uh, taking the floor in this conversation. My name is Marcos Orellana. I am the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. And yesterday I had the opportunity to present uh, my thematic report uh, to the UN Human Rights uh, Council, speaking about the human rights impacts of mercury contamination on, on rights, uh, including food, health, uh, the causing of, of disabilities, um, speaking about the position of individuals and groups in vulnerable situations, in, including especially children, uh, workers in the fence line, so minors, uh, women, and uh, especially perhaps indigenous peoples who are affected in their cultural practices and rights, in their autonomy, self-determination, um, due to the impacts of mercury in contaminated fish that indigenous communities um, uh, used to um, derive their uh, their protein. Mercury, as discussed yesterday, is uh, a heavy metal that is uh, extremely toxic. This explains why the international community has developed a whole new international instrument to deal with the impacts of mercury, uh, the largest source by far of uh, mercury contamination around the world are emissions and releases from artisanal and small scale gold mining. Mercury is a metal that bioaccumulates and so it goes up in the food chain. It is persistent, so it cannot be wished away. And this means that the um, that islanders, for example, thousands of kilometers away from the sources of contamination are impacted due to the fish from the oceans uh, that they eat. The Minamata Convention, as I mentioned yesterday, has, is a robust and comprehensive instrument that addresses the various dimensions of the mercury problem and yet despite its strengths has certain sh shortcomings that have opened the door for this problem in small scale mining to continue and to increase. Um, chief among those limitations are is the fact that it considers mercury use as an allowable use in small scale gold mining. And this is uh, in the recommendations, uh, a point that uh, I'm, I'm putting forward uh, needs to be changed. So not to repeat all that was said yesterday. So I'll, I will stop there with this brief introduction. Um, I encourage you to uh, look at the report in detail if you have not yet uh, done so. But to get into more specific issues and more elaboration and sharing of perspectives on the various uh, dimensions of uh, this topic, we have uh, several panelists joining us today. I will introduce each one in the order they're taking the uh, floor. And so first of all, we have Madam Rosa Vivian Radnawati, who is currently the Director General of Solid Waste Hazardous at the Ministry of Environment of and forestry of Indonesia. Uh, I believe uh, Ms. Uh, Vivian Ratnawati is joining us uh, through a video uh, intervention. So, Mr. Rosa Vivian Ratnawati, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Chair, Excellencies, distinguished speaker, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and a very good day. On behalf of Minister Siti Nurbaya, I would like to express the pleasure of being able to speak at this event to deliver our message and address our common concern on mercury. The exposure of mercury to humans, especially women and children, does not only lead to various health problems, but also contaminates all components of our nature's ecosystem, 
risking our biodiversity, producing hazardous pollution, as well as contributing to climate change. Excellencies, the illegal trade in mercury is on the rise. According to UNEP, the global trade in mercury is failing between 100 US dollar and 215 million US dollar per year. Artisanal and small scale gold mining or ASGM is a major contributor to the illegal trade in mercury. It is estimated that more than half of the mercury used in this sector is potentially illegal. In Indonesia, mercury misuse in this ASGM is of major concern. Indonesia, as one of the most biodiverse country in the world, is also threatened by illegal global mercury trade and environmental pollution caused by mercury emissions and releases. Indonesia is adamant that the problem must be addressed in a systematic and comprehensive manner. Therefore, we are committed to supporting the implementation of the Minamata Convention as an international agreement aimed at protecting human health and the environment from the adverse impact of the use of mercury and mercury compound. Excellencies, allow me to share what Indonesia has carried out to address the use of mercury in ASGM. In 2019, President Joko Widodo has issued presidential regulation on a national action plan for the reduction and elimination of mercury. In our national action plan, the government of Indonesia is aiming to make the country mercury free by 2030. The national action plan garners strong commitment and coordination among stakeholders, as well as monitoring actions in reducing the utilization of mercury, raising awareness among the public on its negative impact, and finding alternative technologies to support industries with zero mercury. Furthermore, in the National Action Plan of Human Rights 2020 to 2024, the government of Indonesia has ensured the implementation and elimination of child labor from the types of work that endanger children are the worst form of child labor, not only in gold mining, but also in all industries. Excellencies, Indonesia believes that no country can single handle fight against environmental issues. Indonesia as the president hero of COP4 Minamata Convention, together with the support of all parties, has worked hard to reach consensus and launch the initiative to mainstream the issue of Mercury's illegal trade under the Bali Declaration to combating illegal trade in mercury during the COP4 Minamata in March 2022, which have four pillars related to international cooperation, conducive and enabling policy and regulations, education, research, and studies. We believe that the continuous work to address these matters lies in the international community. It needs to be collective and concrete to curb the health concern resulting from the ASGM exposure to mercury affecting humans. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in line with the effort to combat the illegal trade in mercury at its COP meeting last June, the BRS Convention also paid important attention to strengthen efforts to combat illegal trafficking 
and trade of hazardous chemical and waste. Synergies between multilateral environmental agreements with related international organizations and other entities are key in preventing and combating illegal traffic and trade in hazardous chemicals and waste. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, having said that, I wish to highlight that the word of the declaration does not stop upon conclusion at COP for Minamata. Rather, it is the beginning of forging further coordination, collaboration, and cooperation to collectively combat mercury illegal trade. The Indonesian government stands ready to work together to combat the illegal trade and use of mercury. Thank you. We'd like to thank, thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Vivian Ratnam Ratnawati for her uh, contribution. We would also, I would also wish to um, to thank uh, the government of Indonesia for its uh, leadership in regards to the Bali Declaration on Combating Illegal Trade of Mercury. Uh, Ms. Ratnawati has also spoken about the importance of. Uh, curbing and tackling the worst forms of child labor and uh, the, the uh, contribution of the international labor organization in this regard can also be highlighted. Um, Ms. Ratnawati had the uh, opportunity to uh, preside over the most recent uh, conference of the parties of the uh, Minamata Convention on Mercury, and perhaps that's a good segue uh, for us to... Um, welcome Ms. Monica Stankowitz, who is the Executive Secretary of uh, the Minamata Convention. So, Monica, very glad to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, 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 for inviting me for the initiative. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be here uh, and to um, contribute to the discussion, the important topic. I'm also delighted to hear from Madam President Rosa Ratnavadi. Indeed, she, she was, uh, you were presiding over COP4 where there were some significant outcomes achieved also relevant top to the topic we are discussing. So also from my side, big thank you to Indonesia for your leadership and for being such a great support to the Minamata Convention. I think I should start by thanking you, Marcos, for choosing the topic for your annual thematic report to be on mercury, artisanal, small-scale gold mining and human rights. And this report paints a picture of the current situation of many people whose health and human rights are affected by the use of mercury in, in this uh, very often informal sector. And this story is really that no one can stay indifferent to. Um, I was in that context, I was really impressed yesterday to hear over 40 countries uh, contributing to the debate on this topic. I could hear through these uh, interactions and presentation uh, a great interest and support and effort by uh, countries, both parties and non parties yet to implement the convention. Uh, we are here invited to uh, discuss and refer to the thematic report you have prepared, and I would like maybe to refer to one point in this report where uh, uh, Special Rapporteur is saying that the human rights violations and abuses from unmanaged informal, informal and illegal mining activity uh, is a failure to adhere to the sustainable development goals. And then they are listed there. This is to end poverty and hunger, to ensure healthy lives, clean water, decent work, sustainable consumption and inclusive access to sustainable development and to protect and conserve lands and waters. And I found that this, this one particular point was really powerful and also reflecting complexity of the situation of artisanal small-scale mining and the fact that there intersect so many dimensions of what we want to achieve regarding sustainable development. At one of the events I attended recently, one person said that uh, mercury-free mining is not a problem-free mining. 
and it will therefore take much more than full implementation of the Minamata Convention to ensure sustainable and responsible mining practices. However, Minamata Convention is a sustainable development convention and does not shy, shy away from the problem and complexity of it. And it was created uh, based on an awareness of the health concerns, especially in developing countries, resulting from exposure on mer to mercury of vulnerable populations, especially women, children, and through them future generations. And continued concern over such mercury exposure were clearly exp expressed by many parties and many stakeholders yesterday. Uh, this is also continued concern to, to our focal point and the parties. And during the recent uh, fourth conference of the parties, uh, parties did pay close attention to negative impacts of mercury pollution on vulnerable populations. And for example, they requested the secretariat to compile views on the needs and priorities of indigenous peoples, as well as local communities with regards to mercury use in artisanal small scale gold mining. So. So this will open up to better understanding collaboration and incorporating the perspectives of vulnerable populations even more. Indeed, Mercury in SGM, I use it as an acronym for artisanal small scale gold mining is the single biggest source of mercury to the environment globally. And we know the convention does not ban the use of mercury in HGM. It requires reducing and feasible, where feasible, eliminating the use of mercury in the sector. And each party that has more than insignificant ASGM and processing and it, at its territory is obliged to develop and implement a national action plan. And these national action plans are therefore the main the main instrument under the Minamata Convention to make it happen, to eventually aim at eliminating use of mercury in HGM and protecting people. Uh, therefore, also, there are quite uh, detailed requirements what such national action plans should contain. And I'm very happy that we have already 20 uh, national action plan officially submitted to the Secretariat. This is also a requirement. And I know that 27 countries are working on their national action plan. And, I'm, and it's very important that once those are finalized and approved that they are submitted to the Secretariat. Uh, having those plans will allow us to understand uh, what reduction in use of mercury can be expected from that measure and how, how they are going to, to help us to achieve what's the goal of the convention. Uh, we already know through this first set of 20 plans that we can expect a, a decrease from over 30, 350 tons per year, which is a current baseline, let's say, to over 100 tons by the end of this decade. But more importantly, these plans must be implemented. Uh, parties uh, have to provide a regular review of the progress. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously, implementation of the plans is a, is a complex issue. And here I would like to express my gratitude to the Global Environmental Facility, which is a financial mechanism of the Convention to help parties to develop the plans and also implement them. And this is part of the of the of the convention package that there are requirements, but also there is a support through convention financial mechanism to achieve what the convention requires. The, there is a one point also, Marcus, you are making in your report, which is also very very strong uh, statement, and this relates to what I do appreciate in the convention that it takes a program pragmatic approach to this problem by allowing time to transition to mercury-free practices and also to transition to, for, for miners to alternatives, uh, uh, alternative uh, jobs. Um, and this, this, this somehow I'm thinking this will not happen overnight. And there is, a, uh, there is, a, there is this argument on the table that uh, banning mercury use in ASGM right away would possibly leads to further marginalizing people. And we are talking about millions of people, miners and their families who are currently engaged in mining and would probably create even bigger market for illegal trade, would probably make it more difficult to reach miners with technical financial assistance if they are operating in the sphere that is clearly illegal. 
and you are making point in the report that all these cannot justify the human rights violations and abuses suffered by communities that are exposed to releases of mercury from SGM. And I take it this is a principal point from your side, but still I see these realities on the ground as well. And maybe this is something you wish to perhaps uh, at the end of the event refer to or further elaborate on. And what is that one of the last points I would also like to, to refer what you conveyed yesterday as the urgency. So it's, a, it's an urgent matter because every day when no action is taken, there are people who are directly affected. And there is indeed no time to spur to, to, to do what we can to transition uh, to mercury free ASGM. And deadlines in the conventions are short, I would say many of them are actually very tight. So if, if we take the entire portfolio, what has to happen each year, each year countries have to do concrete measures. And for example, they have to submit the national action plans to secretariat within three years. Parties can also match this measure with not agreeing to, not giving consent to importing mercury or agreeing to import only a certain amount of mercury that matches what they have planned in their national action plan. And, and indeed, each of the party has full flexibility. Was it what is the time horizon for implementation of the national action plans? And uh, in your one of your recommendations is to have the sunset closed. That, for example, there would be three to five years for for withdrawing or the, the banning the uh, use of mercury in HGM. So it's also something I would like to invite you to elaborate on. That how would you see? that could work this timeline and, and how more effective it would be in eliminating mercury use, knowing all these different national circumstances and complexity. And as a really last point, I would like to uh, invite more countries to ratify the convention. We have 137 parties. We have a steady uh, trend of uh, several new parties uh, each year. And uh, if there is any assistance of any of the countries would like to get for, in this process, we would, from Secretariat, would be more than happy to help. Uh, so thank you so much for now. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for elaborating on all those points and, and putting some uh, key questions also on the table. Uh, one of the uh, points that I wish to pick up uh, is uh, how the Minamata Convention uh, was designed to be a living instrument. And uh, this comes very clearly across uh, when you mention the most recent uh, decision of the Conference of the Parties that um, moves in the direction of further engagement with indigenous peoples, also in the elaboration of, uh, of national action plans. Uh, I, I may take your, uh, your challenge of uh, elaborating further on, uh, on the issues of um, of a ban or to ban or not to ban, if we can put it in simple terms in the uh, in national action plans and, and more generally. Uh, but at this time, um, building on uh, what was uh, discussed yesterday on uh, the uh, the impacts in mainly the hotspots uh, of uh, where artisanal mining and small scale mining are, are practiced are in developing countries many of the people that uh, suffer the harms are the workers and indigenous peoples in these countries. But that is not to say that this is not a global problem. And part of the problem is, as discussed yesterday, in the fact that um, the demand for gold is driven in, uh, by refineries uh, and by gold traders and, uh, and banks that speculate on gold jewelry, most of which find their locations in, in industrialized countries. And, and to discuss some of these issues, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Professor Mark Geth, who is a professor of criminal law at Basel University and who's uh, recently published a book uh, on these issues that gets at, um, at an exhaustive account of the uh, due diligence framework um, uh, that, uh, that governs uh, gold, including in relation uh, with uh, small-scale mining. Uh, and so to elaborate on, more on these issues, Mark, uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Marcos. I hope you can hear me. We can. Um, hear you. That's perfect. Um, Sorry, we can't hear you. 
yet. You can't. Um, oh, maybe we can, no. and maybe I, I can. think. Can you hear <laughs> me now? Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Super. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Marcos, Excellencies, and colleagues. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a short input, and I will use my five minutes, as Marcos has invited me to do, um, to focus on the responsibility of refiners in particular. And now this is for me rather obvious because um, I'm working from Switzerland, a place where at least 50 to 70 percent of the world's gold is being refined. Um, you have heard a lot about the challenges of ASM in general. I think I don't have to belabor the environmental and the human rights issues that are on the table. We are aware of them. Now, if you turn to refineries, for me, they are not much different from banks in the financial circuit, a kind of ideal gatekeepers. Why? They receive gold from all over the world and from all sorts of resources. They are obliged to know where the gold is from. This allows them to assess the risks that, that certain deliveries pose. And they are obliged to go further back than just to the immediate intermediary uh, delivering the gold to them. To give an example, uh, if they receive gold from a trader or a refinery, no, to source from a problematic background. I will not name, give names, of course, but I um, mention if you take a conflict zone, and there I will mention an, a, a country, Sudan, for instance. And if a refinery is known to use um, and to refine um, gold stemming from the conflicts of Sudan, of course, um, it is, or I mean, I could give another example if you know that um, a, a refinery is typically using mercury hotspot gold. I'm, I'm thinking of gold stemming from the Amazonian region. Here I'm thinking of Madre de Dios in Peru, possibly of Brazil, but also of uh, Suriname. Um, here, if you have such a source, they have the duty to follow up to the, uh, to the actual source in the supply chain and to do their due diligence. Now, we have to be careful. It doesn't mean ASG is, ASM sorry, is simply a no-go issue. There are certain no-go situations. I mean, um, gold stemming from an active uh, conflict, that is a problem where you probably have to abstain. But what we do have to look at is, can we mitigate risk? And I think the topic that you've been touching on up to now, mercury, is such a topic where um, mitigation is the issue. Now, um, we all know there are alternatives to mercury, even in ASM. You can source gold and treat it without amalgamating the gold with mercury. There are alternative chemical ways which are far less poisonous. Um, you can teach people that, how to do it. Um, I've been seeing places where they used shaking tables. It takes a bit of time, but it works. I think a lot of it is teaching people that it's far safer and equally effective. That is one of the points. But to be frank, um, I've had a lot of personal experience going to places and I've been also in southern Peru to this place, the famous place La Rinconada and you know people have their hands in the, in mercury and then when you come they are uh, they hand give you the hand just out of the mercury not realizing what hazards they are themselves running and 
they would easily sub sub subject anybody who comes there uh, to that hazard. So I think we really have to uh, find ways of moving away. I think you've, ma you've mentioned not from one day to the next, but teaching how to do it better is one really helpful way. Um, I'm aware that not only the convention doesn't immediately ban mercury, but also certifiers. Take um, uh, Marx Havilar, Fair Mind, Fair Trade. They also kind of permit uh, mercury still to a limited extent. They are saying, well, please use at least closed retorts. Um, so safer handling of mercury. I've also seen that in places, but of course, I think here um, I would like to support you if you say we have to take a step and find a way out. And it's not necessary, mercury, even if, in ASM, if you want to um, source gold, there are alternatives. So I would like to uh, use a word of encouragement there. Turning back to the refineries, um, I think we should expect refiners to take an active role in the safeguard of environment and human rights in general. They know the, exactly what the problems are. Now, what they will probably say is, oh, it's a bit expensive for us, but if you have a refinery, and I'm thinking of those four Swiss refineries, each of them um, with a capacity of at least 700 tons a year, yeah, they do have the funding to actually <clears throat> go back to the origin. And frankly, if they find it difficult, well, why not encourage LBMA, the London Bullion Market Association, to get those 70 um, refineries together and do their due diligence work jointly? I think that is um, uh, also a way forward. Now, my last word here would be, if you want to hear more about these topics, I would like to invite you to virtually or in person to an event on the 27th of October this year in Basel, the, Basel, the second Basel Gold Day. If, and you're most heartily um, invited and we can continue the debate there. It is also about ASN. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for taking the floor and, and sharing with us uh, the, uh, the analysis that, uh, that you've conducted and, and some of your conclusions on these, on these points. If I could uh, offer some praise to your uh, recent book, uh, sometimes um, uh, law and policy books uh, can be incredibly dry and difficult to read, but uh, this one is, is not that at all. It's, it's so accessible and so clear that I would also... Uh, invite or uh, encourage everyone in the room to um, to take a look at it. On your point about alternatives, technological alternatives to mercury in small scale mining, uh, I wish to echo a point that was raised yesterday in the interactive dialogue by Tanzania that uh, uh, shared with the room, the council, uh, their experience in phasing out mercury in, uh, in their national action plan. And so that was quite an important moment because sometimes the, the debate is uh, on transition and how gradual and the speed. Well, are there alternatives? How do we get those into the hands of, of those who need them? Um, another point to pick up, uh, if I may, is uh, that the recent uh, situation, conflict, uh, aggression in the Ukraine has prompted a debate about uh, gold more generally. And, uh, and there, your reference to the LBMA is, is sometimes uh, related to a point of principle made by those in that sector, which is to, to argue that it doesn't matter where the gold comes from. It, it's a fungible metal. It doesn't matter how it was produced. Uh, what matters is uh, the level of purity. And it seems to me that uh, as long as we have that idea 
prevailing in the design of uh, of due diligence frameworks um, we will continue to have a problem with illegal gold or, uh, or, or ASGM mining with mercury and so forth. But um, that is to be continued, and perhaps the second Basel Gold Day that you mentioned is a good opportunity to talk about that further. Um, next in our uh, lineup, we have uh, Yuyun Ismawati, who is the Senior Advisor of Nexus 3 Foundation for Environmental Health and Development and the lead for the International Pollutants Elimination Network on, uh, on small-scale mining. Uh, she's done a lot of work on, on mercury. Uh, she's been involved uh, with uh, various projects in the field uh, with communities and has a first-hand, can offer a first-hand account of what what she's seeing from from those studies. It's uh, my real pleasure, Yu Yun, to welcome you to this uh, to this room. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me and inviting me to this uh, session. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of IPEN, um, an international network with uh, more than 600 NGOs in 124 uh, countries. Um, from our works on Mercury, um, we have some observations uh, on the ground as well as uh, from various studies and uh, recent reports. Uh, I would like to start with uh, our observations on the uh, Mercury trade and importers and exporters. The latest data in 2022, uh, in 2020, uh, shows that the major or the top five ex exporters of mercury, uh, Tajikistan, UAE, Russian Federation, Mexico, and India. India is not an NSGM country. It's, they do not produce mercury. Uh, Tajikistan has their own deposits of cinnabar. However, Tajikistan is not ratified, has not ratified the Minamata Convention yet. Uh, and UAE, obviously not an SGM country, but they are top exporters of mercury. Why? Because UAE is a gold country. So uh, Russian Federation probably um, mine it or extracted it from uh, old uh, industry and, and waste. And Mexico extracted mercury from cinnabar. So cinnabar mining in Mexico is the result of um, the Minamata Convention Agreement that allowing countries to keep mining Sinabar uh, 15 years after uh, the Navarra Convention entered into force. So um, the importers, interestingly, are the ASGM countries, Bolivia in number one, and then the second top importer um, uh, was India, UAE, Russian Federation, and Vietnam. I don't understand why Vietnam imported uh, mercury, but I guess Vietnam imported it for uh, stockpiling and use it for transit uh, country. But India, UAE, and Russia again became uh, the top importers. So the mercury uh, is just go between those two countries, uh, three countries, because they are gold uh, buyers. Um, so um, I would like to um, um, uh, highlight this issue about uh, SGM. So why SGM is mushrooming and, uh, and proliferated in, in many countries? Uh, first is that because the major deposits of gold already mined by large gold mining companies and uh, in the last 50 years. So now the remaining deposits of gold are sitting under the protected areas, indigenous peoples, territories, and uh, in biodiversity sensitive areas, which cannot be exploited by large scale, large scale mining companies. So in the next um, 20, 30 years, I'm expecting to see um, more artisanal mining, any kind of minerals, especially the uh, minerals, uh, critical minerals towards the renewable energy. That will be another challenge. So that's why we see a lot of uh, ASM, ASGM um, mushroomings in many countries, including um, triggered by uh, high gold price uh, during the crisis and pandemic. So 
this driven uh, not only the um, the uh, because of countries have uh, do not have pressures or sunset date to end the use of mercury in their SGM and they were given flexibility to do this. This actually uh, trigger more, um, it's like a, a convergence of crime because by having the opportunity to use mercury to ex ex extract gold, there will be more opportunities for um, uh, illegal traders of gold to smuggle gold between countries and also to sell it into the market without being asked the, um, the due diligence uh, or the, um, uh, what you call it, the, the information, the legal paperwork. Um, I've seen a lot of these things uh, um, happening on the ground. And even in Latin America, gold um, mining and gold trading being used by um, um, uh, uh, the drug dealers now as, as the mean for, for their business. Um, so um, I really appreciate the reports and recommendations provided by Marcos in the report. Um, however, I see some challenges um, uh, that could be or should be considered. Uh, first is regarding the uh, law enforcement agencies and actors. Uh, in some countries, um, law enforcement actors also involve to support and protect or provide security for uh, artisanal miners, uh, financiers, and and um, uh, on the ground. Um, in many places, also law enforcement officers. Um, um, this is officers, you know, not not the agency itself, but sometimes it's the officers on the ground. Uh, let it happen. The the illegality or maintain the illegality and informality because they got red tapes. So if it's in if it's formalized, they will not have this pocket money anymore. So in some places, um, that kind of situations happen. Um, and then in in uh, regards with the law enforcement and court and verdicts, we've seen also some um, uh, judges made the decisions that the confiscated mercury have to be destroyed. Uh, there should be a guidance uh, how to uh, not destroy it, but dispose uh, mercury, confiscated mercury uh, safely or make it not functioning anymore. Because if the decisions of the court um, provided a, a different or, or a confusion, a confusing uh, word, uh, it will be difficult to execute. And then um, I agree with all the proposal to prohibit the import, export, and the use of mercury within three to five years. Uh, and country have to end uh, the use within their uh, national action plan framework. Because if I think there should be a way to convey the message that if they want to keep continue using mercury for SGM, they also should invest more in health services and uh, environmental monitoring, especially mercury monitoring, and provided uh, the secure or secure fund for remediation because the longer they keep using mercury, the bigger the cost. So they have to understand these consequences if countries uh, allow the flexibility to keep using mercury and have their own sunset date, there will be some consequences that they have to pay the cost even bigger. Um, and then um, one thing that I think need to be considered as well is that when um, the phase out or eliminations of mercury or confiscations of mercury taking place in countries, there should be a considerations about um, the environmentally sound storage of mercury. In many cases, uh, we've seen also that the uh, verdict uh, from the court didn't follow up and the confiscated mercury evaporated or disappeared or the number just um, not reflecting the, the, the exact or the actual uh, number that was processed in the uh, early court process. And this is due to the lack of uh, uh, environmentally sound storage of mercury. In many countries, um, confiscated mercury can be uh, resell to the market, uh, sometimes by the law enforcement officers. As, and it's this kind of pressures um, uh, uh, 
keeping the evidence and then resell it um, is really tempting, especially if the price is very high. Um, so lastly, uh, for uh, to ensure all of these uh, confiscations of mercury and eliminations uh, taking place, the biomonitoring, health programs, and cleaning up the contaminated site should be emphasized and supported, especially by international funding. Uh, many children uh, and families in SGM hotspots live with um, disabilities, and this is a long-term effect. And even in Minamata, we've seen that uh, victims are supported even until uh, old age. So uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, looking forward to have uh, further discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yoon, for putting those issues on, on the table. If I could uh, pick up and uh, echo a couple on the issue of intermediaries and in international trade, this has a direct impl impact on uh, questions of traceability, which then link also to due diligence. Um, you also spoke about primary mining of mercury at the time the convention was negotiated and entered into force. Uh, as uh, the report uh, analyzes, uh, mercury from primary mining cannot, should not be used in ASGM, but uh, as we've seen in, uh, in reality, it gets diverted to ASGM. One and second, the obligation in Minamata or the flexibility to uh, use the terminology is, was afforded to countries producing mining mercury at the time uh, to keep their minds open, but it doesn't talk about volumes of production. And we've seen how certain mines that uh, would operate at certain quantities have um, uh, increased exponentially their amounts of, of mining. And so this uh, also fuels the, uh, the international trade in, in mercury. We only have a few minutes left. I thought I would open it up for um, for a couple questions if there is interest in the room. As and as you think about that, um, Monica, on the on the points point that you raised, the, the report underlies two points of principle. One is that um, poverty in itself don't, does not and cannot justify human rights violations. So this is a, a moral standpoint from the perspective of human rights law, and I, I don't need to elaborate on that. Uh, and the second one is that uh, everyone has an adequate standard, the right to an adequate standard of living, and its exercise does not uh, lead uh, to justifications of harming others, and in this case, environmental harm. So those two points of principle are, are articulated, and then the question of viable solutions in, re in re relation to reality, which is indeed complex. We have uh, more than 15 million people employed here, many of whom, in most of whom, in extreme poverty. We have the reality of exposure of minors. We have the reality of exposure of indigenous peoples. All of that framed as human rights violations in the report. We have the reality of contaminated sites. The, as I mentioned, the problem cannot be wished away. The persistence of mercury means that future generations are being impacted. And as you, you just uh, reminded us, we have the reality of, of corruption and, and lack of capacity at the national state level. So in regard to all of that, uh, one of the points that's made is that in articulating and designing a just transition and a viable solution, noting that there are no silver bullets, that uh, uh, the, the having a direction, a timeline upon which the legal use of mercury would expire and we would consider and regard this as an environmental crime um, is, uh, gives us another tool and a sense of direction in order to speed up the urgency that's needed for the the gradual transition. It also speeds up the funding to uh, uh, replace and substitute for in the technologies that employ mercury to non-mercury uh, technologies in the field. Much more could be said on this, uh, but I thought I would take up uh, your invitation and, and challenge. Uh, we're almost out of time, but if in the room there's any question or comment, um, please. You have the floor. 
Yes, thank you so much, uh, Marcos, and, and thanks to really all speakers. Um, and, and time is really short, so I'll try to make a very, very quick point on a very complex issue, um, the one you just addressed, Marcos, I think. Uh, and thank you so much for a very strong report, by the way. Um, I, I felt a bit provoked by um, um, a comment uh, made by uh, Mark Peet um, on, you know, mitigating risks and um, and what is acceptable in principle. So in some situations, we, we would need to um, actually have more of a precautionary principle in conflict area for instance you don't um, you don't uh, you don't uh, buy um, and, and refine gold from this uh, from these areas and obviously as you hear I'm, to, I'm coming from a business and human rights perspective so to say or responsibility of, uh, of uh, private actors um, in the chain in the supply chain um, but actually when um, we talk about mitigating risk it's always a bit of um, we stick to prevention and we don't really go into remedies or into really stopping um, uh, stopping this um, these situations and I think this is a bit of a yeah um, of a, again a, of a, of a, pressure, a provocation to all of us uh, to see if for instance um, having this kind of activities or sourcing gold uh, in the Amazon is less damageable uh, on the mid and long term or even short term than really uh, sourcing gold from from conflict areas so again these different standards in terms of that uh, seems to me really uh, provocating in a way so I stop here I hope I made my point more or less clear uh, I send it back to the panel thank you so much Thank you. If you could very briefly introduce yourself. So for, you know, I'm so sorry. I'm Sandra uh, Epadvaratian with Franciscans International. Th thank you very much, uh, Sandra. So we're almost out of time, but uh, I'll pick up on, on a point that you mentioned, which is the focus on small scale mining in this report does not mean that large scale mining is not a threat to human rights. And this is elaborated in the report that I will present to the General Assembly next month on toxics and indigenous peoples. Uh, but Mark, uh, you were put on the spot by the question. Uh, we only have a few seconds. Uh, we're almost being kicked out of the room, but right of reply, if you could uh, share a thought in, in 15 or 30 seconds, you would have the last word. Oops. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm on again. Um, yeah, I mean, you're perfectly right. First of all, we would like to do something really serious to prevent the risk from uh, conflict areas, but that's very frequently beyond us. Thinking of Congo or so, that's a major issue. And I think you may be right. It is questionable whether we should be grading the risk and say conflict is so much worse than serious uh, human rights violations, child labor, and deforestation, and so on. Because frequently, the two hin uh, are linked. So deforestation in the uh, Amazonian region can also lead to conflict. I get your point, really. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Mark. And so I wish to uh, close by thanking all the panelists, the organizers, uh, everyone yesterday that took the floor. Thank you all for uh, uh, coming over to uh, share uh, your views on these issues. And it's going to be continued. It's not an issue that is going to go away. I look forward to the next steps and to further collaboration with all of you. Thank you very much.